life, life is full of um, full of choices, and you, you and I, everyone here knows that life is full of choices. And from the moment you wake up in the morning, you got to make decision. Well, in fact, before you get out, when when your alarm goes off this morning, you have to make a decision. What I'm going to do? I'm going to just ignore it. I'm just going to press the snooze button. And when you decided to press the snooze button, and then you say. Am I gonna press the snooze button again? You know, or how many times uh, I'm gonna press the snooze button? I know people. I have known. I'm telling you, I know people who set alarm and then wake up an hour later, just keep snoozing, right? I know people like that. Um, so, and life is full of choices from the beginning of the day when when we're about to wake up, right? Uh, even before we get out of bed, and when you get out of bed, then there's more choices. And decisions that we have to make, right? Uh, the fact that you're here, you make a decisions to be here. What to wear, right? That's why I always wear black because I don't have to make a decision. So I'll just pick up my shirt, and it's always the same, regardless of what I pick up, right? And my jeans the same. I got three pair of jeans, they're all black, so I don't have to decide. I just pick the one that is not dirty. That's all easy. But the fact that you all here wearing clothes, you gotta you gotta decide on what to wear and and then what whether you should have breakfast first or not, or which coffee to drink, which coffee to get, uh, how you get here. They're all choices that we have to make. And but there are other choices that are probably bigger than just that. For example, what to study, which you need to go, uh, what job to take, who to marry. It's a big one. And uh, or which city to settle in, or to settle down. So life is full of choices, and uh, where you are today, regardless of where you are today, is partly due to the choices that you made in the past. If you are a bit overweight like me today, uh, it's because of the choices I made last night when I ate the big huge dinner, or the night before, and the night before two years ago. All right, my lifestyle that I decided what what I you know what I do with my exercise and my diet makes me the shape today. All right, so who you are today, where you are in your life today, it's a it partly due to the decisions that you made in your life. So today I'm gonna specifically look at that, looking at the first five verses in the book of Ruth. That life is full of choices. I'm gonna cover this in three. Points. The first one is where we, where we live may affect our choice, the cho- may affect the choices that we have, but nonetheless we make the decision. Okay, so there are so many things on offer, but at the end of the day, we are the one who make the decision. Okay, whether to go A or B, so that's the first one I'm going to look at. We've been offered choices, but we make the decision. The second thing I'm going to talk about is that what we choose have consequences. What we choose in our lives have consequences. And then the third thing is, however, regardless of what we choose and all the consequences, thirdly, I'm going to say is God is always at work in that. That in and through our lives, in our decision, whether it's good or bad, God is at work. So those are the three, three things I'm going to look at this morning. So the first one, where we are, where we live may affect the choices that we have, but we make the decision. So... What is the day, uh, the context of, of the book of Ruth? Okay, so let's look at the verse 1. Uh, if we could put up verse 1 on the screen, that would be awesome. I, I don't think I put it in there. So if you just go back to Ruth 1.1. 1, 1. In the days when the judges ruled, there was a famine in the land, and the man of Bethlehem in Judah went to sojourn in the country of Moab, he and his wife and his two sons. So out of so many different ways to start a story, to start a book, this is how the author of the book started. So we're going to look at it. So this, so this sets a context for us. What are we reading? It says, it says that Elimelech right, and his family lived in the days when the judges ruled. So what does that mean? So for, for the reader in those days when the book was written, was written for, they know when they read this, that Elimelech lived in the days when the judges rule, they know what does that mean. But for us, because we are 3,000 years apart, we need to do a little bit more work. What does that mean to live in the days when the judges rule, right? So 
if you bring a physical Bible, it's quite easy because before Ruth is the book of Judges. And then you just look at the last verses of the book of Judges. It says this. So Judges 21, 25. In those days, there was no king in Israel and everyone did what was right in his own eyes. So there's two things that jumps up when it comes to what it means to live in the days when the judges rule. First one, there's no king in Israel. So in the, in the, kingdom, in, in the kingdom of Israel, there's no king. And second thing, because there's no king, everyone did whatever seems right to him. So the two things, basically, well, when you read that, well, that's not such a bad, bad thing, you, you might say, right? Because we, we are so distant from that period of time, we, we don't understand what does that mean? Like no king and then ed, everyone did what was right in his own eyes? What's wrong with that? Well, let me tell you what's wrong with that. It's a big problem because this is, this is what it means. Imagine a family with five young children and there was no parents in that household. So there was no king, there was no parents in that household, and all the children, all the young children, everyone did whatever they want to do. If they think, ah, oh, I'm just going to eat cookies from morning till night, I'm going to do that. I'm going to play games, Fortnite, from morning till afternoon, I'm going to do that. I'm going to sleep at 2 a.m., I'm going to do that. I want to wake up at midday, I'm going to do that. Right? So everyone, all the kids, uh, I'm just describing my kids here, so <laughs> all the kids did what was right in their own eyes, um, and that was the problem. That was a big problem. So when, when the authors start with this, it says to us that this is not a good time. This is not a good period of time. And it also says then there was a famine, right? So that's another bad thing. So when, when they say they live in the time of judges and there was a famine, so we could probably read in the sense that because the people are living in a rebellious way, in a way that there is no king in their life, a famine could be a punishment, so to speak, that comes upon them because of their rebellious living. Okay, But before we look at that, uh, let me say a little bit about the rebellions that the people during this Judges period. Okay, So what happened is, in the book of Judges, you can see there are about 13 Judges, from Othniel to the famous Samson. If you grew up in the church, you know this famous guy, called Samson. So Othniel is a, from us, he's a very squeaky clean judge. No mistake. But Samson, he's a wayward, kind of not so good judge. Okay. So there's a kind of regression, even in the quality of the judge. But then each of the judge has its own cycle. The cycle is, goes like this. God's people sin, right? So the people of God sin against God, and then God sent enemies to oppress them. And then they were oppressed, and they cry out to God in repentance. They repent, they cry out to God. And God in His mercy forgive them and send a judge to deliver them from the enemy. And then they live for a period of time of peace until the judge died. And then they went away rebelling against God again. And then God sent the enemies again to oppress them. And then they repent and they cry out to God again. And so on. They, the, the loop, the cycle keeps going on that way until towards the end, the cycle kind of change. There's no longer repentance and crying out to God for help anymore. So that's the time of judges. So they are so deep in their sin and keep repeating, making the same mistake until to the point that they, they can't be bothered even to repent and cry out to God for help anymore. So that's, that's, that's the context that we're in. And then there was a famine. So it is no coincidence that... Um, that the author of the book begins this way, right? Because without this, we wouldn't understand what we are reading. What, what, what is the context here? Because they're so far distant, so far back, like, you know, three, about 3,000 years ago. So, so it, it's helpful for us to see. And also because it's so far, we may not even know what a famine looks like, right? So what, what, what is a famine? Well, a famine is a this is straight from dictionary. Famine is a situation in which large numbers of people have little or no food and where many of them die. So famine is not like, man, I need a Macus run, kind of hungry, right? It's not. Famine is where people die. There's no food. You can't go on a Macus run, right? There's no Macus. There's no 24-hour Macus. You just can't. Like, it, people die because of famine. So this is a serious time. It's a... 
it's a bleak time, period of time. So we, we may think that because we live in a prosperous nation, prosperous nation like Australia or any other prosperous nation in the world, that we're not facing famine. But I think this book speaks to us, even though we may not be facing a physical famine, we are facing, I think there are a lot of us uh, in, in Australia, especially that we have this spiritual famine that's happening. And that's why there's a lot of people today, uh, could be you, could be your friends, who are looking something that is kind of beyond their physical ability. So there's kind of spiritual hunger in their lives or spiritual emptiness in their lives. So, so my question is then, are you hungry today? And are you seeking for, and, and because you're hungry today, spiritually and physically, um, exhausted and hungry, because of that, we are seeking someone or something to satisfy our hunger. You know, when, you, when you're physically hungry, you're seeking something to eat. But when you're spiritually hungry, sometimes we do not know what to seek. We just feel like something is missing in my life. I, I don't know what, but I'm just not satisfied. I'm, I'm just not content. So are you hungry? Are you seeking for something or someone to satisfy your hunger? <coughs> Something that gives meaning, perhaps, to your life this morning. So in order to know what that something or someone, you may want to ask this question. What, what actually you are pursuing in your life? What are you chasing after in your life? Right? So for example, if you ask yourself, what, what gives you the most joy? What gives you the smile in the morning when you wake up? Like, you know, man, today is a good day. Or what gives you a, a, the most headache or nightmare that keep you awake at night that couldn't that makes you unable to go to sleep what keeps you awake the nightmare that you have at night perhaps that might give you an idea what is the meaning of your life today what gives you meaning so for some that could be their children that gives them meaning because of their children they couldn't sleep at night the the thought of their children are just keeping them awake or their children at the same time could be their most joy in their life. The reason that they wake up in the morning is for their children. All right? So whatever that is, think about that, okay? As, as, we, as we look through this passage together this morning. So another thing I want to look at, at ver in verse 1 is this. And a man of Bethlehem in Judah went to sojourn in the country of Moab, right? The word sojourn means a short stay in a place that is not your home. That's that's what it really means, right? So their intention, Elimelech and his family, the intention is to, because there's famine in Bethlehem, in their hometown, in the promised land, the plan is to sojourn, to sort of move temporarily for a short time to Moab, right? So this is kind of a kind of strange thing because, and, and I think it's, it meant for us to see it. The word Bethlehem means the house of bread. And what the author of the book is saying, there is no bread in the house of bread. And it's a disaster when it's, it's like there's no bread in bakery, right? Or there's no fruits in a fruit shop or whatever. It, it's just like unbelievable. It's house of bread. How can the house of bread have no bread? So that's what happened there. But we are seeing the reason there's famine, there's no bread in the house of bread because they live in the day of judges that the people are rebellious. They are sinful people rebelling against God. Okay? And the word sojourn, I, I want us to jump quickly to, uh, so the intention is to sojourn, to stay for a short time. But if we jump to verse 2, at the end of verse 2, they say, it says this, they went into the country of Moab and remained there. Okay? So verse 2, and they remained there. Okay? So from planning of sojourning, instead of just staying for a short time, short period, they actually remained there. And then didn't stop there. If you look at verse 4, the last part of verse 4, the last sentence of verse 4, it says, they live there now about 10 years. So from sojourning to uh, remain there, to become like making them, ma making the place permanent place to stay they live there for
for at least about 10 years. Now, the, the reason I point guys, you guys to all of these is because of um, the people of God are put by God in the promised land for a reason, that they can be light to all the nations around them, right? So the nation around can see, okay, this is what people of God looks like if they live obeying the Lord. They are blessed by God and all those things. Yet, the problem here is the people of God choose to leave the promised land and go to Moab, the enemies of God. So there's a problem there already. So the author of Ruth sets us the scene that is what the people are doing is not good here. Okay, so leaving Bethlehem, which is the promised land, from the author point of view, is the wrong decision to make. So Elimelech and his family is presented with a choices. Okay, there's rebellious nation here. There's famine here. What you're going to do? And they choose to leave. Okay, so that's the decision that they make. Instead of repenting of their sin, because... The famine was brought about of their, because of their rebellions, because of their sin. Because of, re, because of that, instead of repenting, Ali Malik and his family say, well, we're just going to run away. We're just going to go to a better nation that has food, that has bread. Okay? So that's what they did. That's the decision that make, they make. And another thing I want to point out here is that the name Ali Malik. So Bethlehem, house of bread. And then what, what did I say about the days of Judges? He said, in those days, there's no king. In Israel and the name Elimelech means my God is king so in the days there was no king there's this guy whose name is my God is king should have stood up firm in his you know true to his name and his foundation and his belief that's like well while my nation lives life as if there's no king I'm gonna stand and stood still firm saying that my God is king but no, he didn't do that. Instead, he chose to go to Moab. He just followed along with the rest of the people. Okay? So my questions again, along the line of, are you hungry today? Is Are you facing a famine in your life perhaps today? Just like Ali Malek and his family. Are you spiritually hungry? Are you not satisfied? Do you feel like there's something missing in your life? See, the, there are a couple of reasons for famine. One is, if God is not yet a priority in life, if, if Jesus is not your God and Savior, it, perhaps God wants to draw you back to Himself. That's why you've, you experience this spiritual hunger that something is missing in my life. Something feels like it's not complete. And I don't know what, right? So it's probably perhaps God is calling you, drawing you back to Him. But if God is the priority in your life, if, if Jesus is your Lord and Savior, you say, like, I, I believe in Christ Jesus, perhaps God wants to test you in order for you to grow. If you're facing a famine, if you're facing circumstances that is, you know, beyond your understanding, it's like, why God, I, I trust you. I, I give my life to you. Why am I going through this time, this difficult time in my life? Well, perhaps God want to test you and grow you into maturity. So that's the first point that we, there's so many choices that we could make in our life. Right? So... We, we need to, uh, to understand that regardless of what being presented to us, at the end of the day, we are the one who make decisions. So make decisions wisely. The second thing I want to say is what we choose though, however, the decisions that we make, however, have consequences in life. So Ali Malek and his family decided to not only sojourn, they remain there and they live there in Moab. Okay? So what, what, what happened then? What happened then? Verse 3 says, this is what happened after they decided to do that, right? Verse 3, but Elimelech, the husband of Naomi, died. And she was left with two her two sons. So there's a couple of consequences of their decision, Elimelech and, and the family decision to move to Moab, okay? Um, so the first consequences, the first consequences that they of their decision is the death of Elimelech. So because they decided, it's it's an irony, isn't it? Like you try to run away from famine so that you can preserve your life, so that you you don't die. Yet as they move and decided to rebel against God, Elimelech 
died. So leaving Naomi as, as a widow. So, so remember the story of the cycle in the judges that's really pretty much a downward, downward spiral. It's not, it's not a cycle that is equal. It gets worse and worse, right? Even the judges, the quality of the judge get worse and people don't even, towards the end, they don't even repent anymore. So the same thing happens here, you see. Uh, when, when Elimelech died, Naomi and her two sons are presented with another offer on the table. What must they do? Obviously, one of the uh, options is to go back, to go back home, right? But that's when we read they decided to live there. Instead of going back, they say, okay, Elimelech died. We get it, Lord. This, perhaps this is, you know, running away from you is not a good idea. We, we, perhaps we should obey you and, and go back home to the promised land, to the, the home that you have provided for us, right? But that's the right response, but that's not what they did. So let's read verse 4. These two, uh, then the, they left with her two sons, it says, and then these two sons took Moabite wives. The name of the one was Orpah, and the name of the other, Ruth. So instead of moving back, they choose to settle down. The two sons took wives, the Moabite wives. What, what, what's wrong with the Moabite's wife, you might ask, right? Well, first, Moab is the son of Lot, born out of incest with Lot's older daughter. daughter. So there's Moab and Ammonite. So the, older, the two daughters of Lot, Lot slept with both of them and give birth to Moab and Ammon. So, uh, so Moabites are uh, born out of incest, and they were, Moabites were enemies of God, God's people, right? So they're enemies of God's people. And the king of Moab, Balak, if you grew up in church again, this is an amazing story. Balak is a, is a king of Moab who hired a prophet Balaam to curse Israel, right? But he, un, he was unable to. And in that story, there's a donkey who was God made to speak, okay? So king of Moab, Balak hired a prophet to curse the people of Israel. And the word, so the, in, in, in this story of Ruth, you'll hear and read a lot of uh, description about, uh, about uh, Ruth the Moabite. So when, when you read that, you, or you should think about something, the, the, the adjective Moabite is not a good ad adjective. Okay? It's not a good word to describe a person in, in the Bible. Okay? So when they say a Moabite woman, it means to say, well, this is a Gentile woman. And this is the background of Moabite people. So it's not, it's not a good thing, okay? So when it says, oh, they, they, they took, instead of going back and repented, they, they took a Moabite wife. So from, from bad to worse, okay? And uh, first five, let me read to first five. And both Mahlon and Chilion, this is the two sons of uh, Naomi, died so that the woman was left without her two sons and her husband. There are three men in the house, all three died. So the second consequence is that is the death of Naomi's sons. The first one is the death of Elimelech, and the second one is the death of Naomi's son, Malon and Chilin. So leaving all three of them widows. Now, widows, you may think like, well, that's fine, we know uh, they can get married again, they do this and that, uh, it's fine, but widows in the in those days, in the ancient Near East, they're not good news, right? In those days, uh, widows basically have no power, no, no, uh, no status at all. They, they have no social status, they have no political status, they have no economic status. And I can tell you the homeless people today that you see on the street of Melbourne is better, has a better status and uh, quality of life than the widows in those days. So if one widow in a house is bad news, three widows, it's really, really bad news. And that's what happened here. So all decisions in life matters. We are offered with plenty of choices in life. We are the one who make the decision. But all, and, and second point is our decision have consequences in life. So the world is constantly selling us their goods to us, offering us plenty to choose from. You can just go to the supermarket aisle, the number of, you know, jams, the number of strawberry jams. It's just 
everywhere. Cereal, it's not so easy to just, oh, go get chocolate cereal or whatever. There's just so many cereal. The, the world is giving us more and more and more, selling out their goods, offering us plenty to choose from. And what you choose have consequences, whether good or bad. Have consequences, whether good or bad. The nature of, the nature of bad decision and sin is this, that you will get sucked in deeper and deeper into it. And when you try to fill your hunger, your emptiness with anything but God, you will go down deeper into a pit. So people who are get sucked in into this lie, they're just going to get sucked in more and more and more. It will suck all the joy out of you and destroy your life one day. Before you know it, you'll find yourself unable to get out of it. That's why people get addicted in life. That's why people get extremely obese. They get to this point of their life, they, they cannot get out of it anymore because they get sucked in deeper and deeper into the pit. So our decisions matters. Third thing I'm going to close in this last point is this, that God always at work in and through our lives among our decisions, whether bad or good. Okay? So don't think that because we make a bad decision, God is not at work, that God is not involved in our lives anymore. Suddenly, he removed himself from our lives and said, well, Eli Malek and Naomi and all of you, because you decided to leave me and go to Moab, I'm going to leave. You, you, you'll be on your own. No, God is at work even in that, in and through their lives. So even, even in this short and seemingly bleak introduction of the book of Ruth, we must learn, and rec- must, we must learn to recognize that God is at work. Okay? It was, it was God in the first place who brought the famine and it was God who took the lives of Elimelech and the two sons. So the story of Ruth, at least, uh, in the first five verses at least, teaches a couple of things. The first one is, life gives us choice, but we make the decision and all decisions have consequences. And finally, that God is in control even in our bad decision. Not just in our good decision, but even in our bad decision. All right. So what you go after and chase in your life could be the very thing that drives you away from God, as we've seen in Elimelech. So what Elimelech chose and decided to do, to move, is the very thing that drives them away from God. So while we are constantly being seduced by um, the greener grass next door, uh, my, my grass is not so green, and we're all constantly being seduced by next door green, uh, green grass, right? They, they all seem to be greener than our grass. But often we are not told the hidden costs behind the green grass. As the popular saying goes, the grass is greener on the other side, but so is their water bills. So there's fine prints. So when the, the world offers us seemingly good thing in life, what we are often not told are what are the hidden costs? What are the price we must pay? What are the price we must pray? We, we must pay. What at risk here is that by going after something that is not the real joy, a lesser joy in our life, to fill in our hunger, we are abandoning, abandoning the fullness of joy that we can only find in God. We seek this temporary joy and satisfaction in our life. Without realizing it, we are abandoning what God has in store for us, which is fullness of joy. Because we are so short-sighted, we can't see the big picture that God has planned for our lives. So we, we chipping in away, chipping away bit by bit from God. So just as Ali Malik, right? If you've seen, he started by abandoning the house of bread to Moab because they have plenty of food, but it didn't turn out well for him. So the water bill, the hidden costs, what are they in your life, in the decisions that you make in your life? Are they hidden costs, the fine prints that you forgot to read? There's no such thing as freelance, you see. Your joy, your satisfaction, my satisfaction has a price. My purpose in life has a price. It comes at a cost, right? And the good news today is, that cost, that bill for our satisfaction, our joy and our purpose in life, the meaning of life and our 
security or, or guarantee of eternal life has been paid for. So all the hidden costs, all the fine prints, all the things that we must do, that's been done. How is it done? Well, the Bible says this in 1 Corinthians 6.20. I'm just going to read to you. 1 Corinthians 6.20. It says, you were brought with a price, saying that you and I, when we come to Christ, it's not free. We may not have to pay anything, but someone paid for it. And it says, we were bought for a price. And Mark 10, 45 says, even the Son of Man, describing Jesus, even the Son of Man, Jesus, came not to be served. He's God who came to become the creation, did not come to be served by us, the creator, uh, the creations. But instead, he came to give his life as a ransom for us. As a ransom means to pay for our sins. To pay for our debts. And 1 Peter 1.18 Knowing that you were ransomed from the futile ways inherited from your forefathers, not with perishable things such as silver or gold. So what Peter says here, we are paid for by the blood of Christ. We are ransomed from much more valuable thing than silver or gold. So I want to speak to two things this morning, and I'm going to close. The first thing is, if you've been running away from your Bethlehem, if you've been running from the house of bread, if you've been running away from God all these years, maybe this morning, maybe the message of Ruth in the introduction is that God's saying, don't harden your hearts. Do not harden your hearts. Don't turn away from me, God says. Don't run away to Moab. Come home to me. Return to God today. But there are some of you I know who are in God and love Jesus in your life and been following Christ and being obedient to Him today, but yet you're still enduring and suffering famine in Bethlehem. You're in Bethlehem. You're in the promised land. You are in Christ, but you're suffering right now. And God is speaking to you this morning as well. And there's good news for you is that God is at work. Do not think just because you're in your suffering, in your famine, that God suddenly is removed from you, that God does not know your suffering, what you're going through in life. God is always in control, and we will see in the next four weeks that God is in full control. He provides His mysterious and providence throughout the story of Ruth it's in an amazing way. So if, you're, if you are in Christ and you're enduring famine in your Bethlehem, in your promised land, my, my good news for you is this, that God is still at work. And perhaps you are being tested so that you can grow more beautiful, more glorious for the sake of Christ in order that God's name be glorified through you and in you. You see, for people to be so joyful and happy and satisfied when they have much and no longer not experiencing any difficulties, that, that's not a big deal. Your colleagues who do not know Christ can look at you, well, you have everything. You have a good family. You, you, get all, you, get all the, you have all the stuff that you need, you have all the problems, you're like, of course you are happy and satisfied. Even the world can see that. But if in your suffering, in, in all your lackings, you still have joy and you can still be generous, though yourself are lacking, you can be generous and be giving in your life, people can see glory in that. People can see the beauty in that. People then can see that truly there's something more important in your life than what meets the eye. So if that's you this morning, be encouraged that God is still at work and He's just disciplining you, testing you so that you grow more and more to be more like Christ. But if you're not in Christ, but if, you, if you're not in Bethlehem, perhaps God is knocking at the door of your heart this morning. Say, return to me. Return to Bethlehem. Return to God. Let's close our eyes.